wonderful to be here, having a fascinating day. Um, so this talk is about non-coding DNA and how we think about what it encodes. And um, uh, the reason I started to think about this is actually um, evolutionary work that I did a long time ago now when I was a postdoc. And um, discovered that the fastest evolving regions of the human genome are mostly outside of coding genes in totally uncharacterized DNA. So my lab has been spending uh, a lot of time over the last decade or so to try to understand uh, if those mutations make a difference to human phenotypes. More recently, we and many others have started also thinking about the problem of non-coding mutations in a disease context motivated by the finding that most genetic associations are also outside of, 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 of genes. Um, so uh, this is a hard problem. There are a lot of non-coding mutations. Many of them are not functional. Um, and uh, a few of the challenges are that some of them are in elements that are very important for the cell and its gene regulation. Some of them are not. And we don't really know where the regulatory elements and the structural elements are in the DNA. We're getting better at that. But I would argue that today, even with all the functional genomics data we have, there are still many regions that have the marks of regulatory elements but are not actually functional, biologically active enhancers. So we need to do better at that. Even if we knew, for example, that the T to C mutation here that's linked to this genetic association was an enhancer and therefore maybe more likely to be the causal variant, it would be hard to figure out how it was involved in a trait um, if we were following up the wrong gene. And unfortunately, that happens a lot of the time because the closest gene, according to these chromatin capture assays that we just heard about, um, is the target gene only about 8 to 10 percent of the time. So we need better techniques to try to map the variants to the pathways that they affect. And then finally, which is more the focus of the talk today, um, what happens if you mutate a non-coding element that is a functional enhancer, is looping to the promoter of a gene? We can, have seen many examples where there's no effect at all, and others where a single nucleotide variant has a huge effect. Um, so we're not very good at interpreting that. So, um, before talking about this new angle on the problem, which relates to the shape of DNA, I wanted to briefly give you a little bit of context about other projects in my lab that led us to the project that I'm going to focus on today. And these are, uh, broadly include uh, approaches to these different problems. Where are the enhancers? What genes do they target? And what happens if you mutate them? And most of the work uses vast quantities of publicly available data mined using machine learning methods. So in terms of where the regulatory elements are, putting these green boxes on my toy example, um, we've published some work and we do have some ongoing work as well um, using more sophisticated machine learning methods than in our publication to try to predict from data that's freely available, including the DNA sequence itself, but it's also evolutionary signatures and functional genomics data where biologically active enhancers are. And um, I would say the key lesson for me from this work was that we need biologically validated <laughs> examples to learn from. So these in vivo enhancer assays, and now my lab and others are doing uh, in vitro versions of those assays, for example, in these beating heart cells. Um, with mass, which you can do in massive parallel, um, MPRAs they're called, massively parallel reporter assays. So um, the key for us was not to try to predict sort of one kind of functional genomics data from another kind, but to integrate that data to, to predict something that you could actually biologically validate. Um, in terms of predicting what gene a non-coding element targets, we have, um, again, been using machine learning to integrate massive amounts of data. And I thought this would be an incredibly hard problem. And as you just heard, with even one type of data, DNA's hypersensitivity, you can make pretty good predictions. 
<laughs> integrating a lot of different types of data, um, we were able to, with very high accuracy, identify these long-range interactions. And this surprised me a lot, I'll be honest. I thought it was a mistake when I first saw these performance results. But what was more interesting than the fact that we can make an in silico high C, I think, is what we learned from the features that are in that model that are highly predictive of interactions. And in particular, um, we saw that what's going on on the intervening piece of chromatin between an enhancer and promoter is more informative than the signatures at the enhancer and promoter. So when a loop forms, there are different proteins decorating that looping chromatin than there are on non-interacting, when there's not an interaction between the enhancer and promoter. Um, and this has led us into sort of a new realm where we're trying to actually understand the roles of these proteins that are decorating the loops, actually, in the mechanisms of chromatin uh, interactions and gene regulation. Uh, in terms of predicting the effect of a mutation, a non-coding mutation, this, as I mentioned, is hard and uh, leads into the work that I'm going to talk about today on DNA shape. What the small contribution that we made uh, was again to try to use biological validation to understand what was going on. So um, we looked at sequences that had a few differences and tested in embryos, whether they drove different expression patterns in a reporter assay. So here the domain mark number two was present, there was expression on the left-hand side and in absence, uh, no expression in domain two on the right-hand side with a sequence that had three or four mutations in it compared to the left-hand side. And then we asked what predicts this divergent function. And the conservation over evolution of the base pair is mildly predictive, but if you consider whether the mutations, regardless of how evolutionarily conserved they are, whether they disrupt transcription factor binding sites or not, you can do better. And so it's important to think about the binding sites. But, and we were happy with this, but there was still fairly poor performance. This is an uh, area under um, a ROC curve. And um, what it doesn't show you is that the precision is actually pretty low. Um, so this is decent AUC, but there are still a lot of mistakes that are getting made. So um, we started thinking about the fact that transcription factor binding is only weakly determined by the sequence motifs. So we can all think about reasons why that might be true. There are many proteins whose motifs are not well characterized, Probably many of you have found motifs that you think have problems with them. Motifs that are derived in vitro, which is how many of them are derived, may not be the in vivo binding site motif. Um, so there are a lot of reasons. Um, and I started thinking that maybe we should just first quantify how often binding occurs without a sequence motif. And, uh, um, Maybe someone has done this before. I haven't seen a very thorough characterization of it. So we started by uh, looking at the human ENCODE data for 110 transcription factors. <coughs> and we looked at the top 2,000 peaks for each transcription factor, the, what appeared to be the most strongly bound regions in the genome. And we asked if they contained sequence motifs or not. And we wanted to be uh, very generous about calling sequence motifs. So we did it in a number of different ways. And what we found that was that on average, 56% of the best peaks for a transcription factor lack a sequence motif. And that was higher than I expected. My intuition was that there were some, but I did not realize it was such a large number. Um, and just so you think we didn't gain this to look bad, we, um, took every good approach we could think of to find sequence motifs. We scanned with TransFAC and JASPAR PWMs with a reasonably loose cutoff for calling matches to the matrix. We then did de novo motif finding with two different algorithms um, and called up to five de novo motifs for each transcription factor and used those. So the 56% means none of the known or de novo motifs from this broad collection were found in 56% of the peaks. So 
something else is going on. I should point out that that percent, that's an average across 110 transcription factors, it varies. So some sequence, uh, some transcription factors do have a lot of sequence motifs. So on the low end, only 22% of the top 2,000 peaks lacked a sequence motif. On the high end, it was almost all of them. Nearly 90% had no sequence motif. Um, and we did this across different cell lines and saw that it was fairly consistent. So um, this begs the question, how are transcription factors recognizing their binding sites? So our hypothesis was that many transcription factors are actually recognizing the shape, the actual structure of the DNA, without necessarily needing nucleotide specificity. So let me explain how we came to that hypothesis. This is based on work of others, including Rima Rose, um, Richard Mann, Harman Bussemaker, who have focused on regions of the genome where there are sequence motifs and shown that shape can be important at those binding sites. So when there is a sequence motif, those positions often have a similar shape. And by shape, I mean things like the minor groove width or the helical twist. Um, and also, when you have families of transcription factors that bind similar sequences but do, do not bind in the same place, so it looks like they ought to bind each other's binding sites, shape features can distinguish those binding sites. So shape is clearly important, at least for some transcription factors, in the context of sequence motifs. Um, but none of this prior work had thought about shape independent of, of, the, of the nucleotide sequence. It was thinking of these, these other works were looking at sequence and thinking of shape as adding some specificity or additional information. But very different sequences can encode the same shape. So for example, a very small minor groove width can be encoded by very different nucleotide sequences. So it occurred to us that you could have shape recognition without a, con a, a consistent sequence underlying those conserved shapes. That's how we came to this hypothesis. So our approach was to develop an algorithm that would learn shape motifs de novo. So learn the shape preferences of different transcription factors agnostic to their sequence preferences. So, the method um, depends on a program from the Rose Lab um, called DNA Shape that can translate the whole genome into a vector of shape features. And here are four that we used in our study, the minor groove width, propeller twist, roll, and helical twist. They're describing the structure of the DNA, the orientation and the spacing of the nucleotides in different DNA sequences. And what the Rose Lab showed was that through molecular dynamic simulations that you can predict or quantify the uh, values of these features in five base pair windows. Flanking sequence outside of those windows is not particularly important. So this allows a very efficient translation of the nucleotide sequence into vector of four shape features at every position along the entire genome. And we define then a shape motif in the same way that we all think of sequence motifs as an overrepresented pattern in the profile values for one or more of these structural features. So think about them one at a time. We're starting to think about them also together, but in this initial work, just one at a time, an overrepresented <coughs> pattern of minor groove width, for example. And we followed um, ex and extended the framework used to find sequence motifs. We use Gibbs sampling. And the extension that was needed um, was to come up with a score <coughs> to optimize that uses a numeric feature rather than the four nucleotides. So the Gibbs sampling algorithms for de novo motif <coughs> finding, sequence motif finding have a different uh, score that they're optimizing. And we just used the um, exponential of the sum of the pairwise distances between the <laughs> instances. 
So just a, like a Euclidean distance between the uh, values of the features. We scan different window sizes, and uh, in terms of implementation, we took a subset of bound regions to learn the motifs, and then you can scan other regions of the genome and score hits the same way you would with a sequence motif. We needed to call hits, we needed a null distribution for these shape features. And then we can score both bound regions and some control regions, like flanking nearby regions, and find motifs. I, let me explain this figure. This is showing um, the vertical axis some feature, let's say minor groove width, along a DNA sequence that's about 100 base pairs long. And you can see the value is hovering around 5 for most of the window, and the gray are confidence intervals. So there's a lot of variation in minor group width. In the middle of this window, which is the motif, there's a very distinct pattern of high and then low and high minor group width with very tight confidence intervals around it. That's what I mean by a shape motif. And finally, after looking at motif hits, just like you would with sequence motifs, we can calculate enrichment p-values, for example, with hypergeometric tests. So here is what we found. Out of 110 ENCODE transcription factors, 80% have at least one shape motif. So for at least one of these four shape features, they are recognizing that shape feature in their top 2,000 peaks. Um, many transcription factors recognize more than one shape feature, and uh, sometimes we hear two cell lines, sometimes they use a shape motif in one cell line and not in another, and sometimes the motif comes up in both cell lines. So first a little bit of description of the shape motifs that we found, a uh, validation essentially, they look functional. So they are centrally enriched in the ChIP-seq peaks. They are, tend to occur in regions that have been annotated independently as regulatory by a variety of methods, and they have a similar GC content to sequence motifs. There are some differences. They are longer in general than sequence motifs, on average about 15 base pairs. And in terms of the sequences that underlie them, so we, after finding a shape motif, in various sequences, we can ask, what would the sequence logo of it be? What would sequences underlie that shape motif? And those sequences are not all the same, as I suggested in my initial hypothesis. There are different sequences that can encode the same shape. And so the information content on the sequence level is about half that of what sequence motifs have. So they would not look like, in general, not look like sequence motifs. I will show you some exceptions. So now we have a way to find shape motifs, and we, there were already good ways to find sequence motifs and to score them, and we can look across different transcription vectors and different cell lines and ask what the genomic patterns of these motifs are. Do they co-occur? Do they not co-occur? So first of all, those, all those chip seek peaks that I described at the beginning that had no sequence motif, the majority of them do have a shape motif. So we, I haven't explained everything. There are still some that don't have a shape motif, um, but the majority of them do. So we can explain many of the peaks that don't have a sequence motif. And in fact, there are about 20% of all peaks, on average, are shape only. They have no sequence motifs, uh, not a match to the PWM for that factor itself, and not a match to any, uh, any other transcription factors motif. What is perhaps even more interesting is to look at the cases where a binding event, a chip seek peak, contains a shape and a sequence motif. So about 27 or 25% uh, on average of peaks for these 110 encode transcription vectors have both. And so the question is, are they the same? Are they overlapping? Are they nearby each other? Or what's the relationship between them? We see a variety of really interesting different patterns. So here's a case where they're the same. <coughs> On the left side, 
is a roll motif that we learned for NRSS. It's this oscillating value of roll across a 20 base pair window. And we can look at the instances of that in ChIP-seq peaks and ask what sequences are there and build a logo. So as I mentioned before, you can see the information content is low. It's about half uh, as many bits as the actual sequence motif has. However, you can see that the underlying sequences do actually represent the known sequence motif for NRSF. So in this case, the sequence motif that we all know and know well is encoding oscillating roll. There are some other things that can also encode that, but most of the instances actually have a good match to the sequence motif. However, in many cases, that's not what happens. So here is a case where there's an extension of the known sequence motif. So CFOS has this strong preference for a propeller twist that dips and then rises above the average value over about 15 base pairs. And the underlying sequence is shown there. And you can see the sequence motif on the left-hand side. So the left-hand side of the sequences that are underlying the shape motif match the sequence motif. But there's a flanking region here that is not part, is low information content on the sequence level is not part of the known sequence motif, this GC rich region, but it's very important for the shape. So CFOS needs perhaps this flanking sequence. So this is extending our concept of the sequence motif by realizing there is some nucleotide recognition most likely, um, but also this flanking shape recognition. There are also many cases where there is a strong shape motif for a transcription factor that is not related at all to its sequence motif. So this is MAF, has a helical twist motif in K562 cells, a strong dip in helical twist in the middle, this sort of symmetric pattern. There is actually a pretty strong <coughs> consensus sequence for creating. There are not a lot of ways to create that motif that helical twist shape motif. So a T-A-A-T and often underlies that. Not always, but often. And that doesn't match the sequence motif at all. And so these are occurring actually at different places <coughs> in the sequence, in the genome. So math can bind its sequence motif, but it can also recognize these regions that have this helical twist motif. And what we're working on now is to figure out what's different in those two contexts. Is there a cofactor binding? Is there a different epigenetic context, etc.? cetera? Uh, since many transcription factors can homo or heterodimerize, uh, is one when it binds alone and one when it binds with two copies or with a cofactor, for example. Uh, Lastly, and, and very interestingly, in the context of thinking about cofactors, shape motifs can flank sequence motifs. So they're not overlapping, but there's a conserved spacing between them. So this is a CFOS roll motif. It's sort of the mirror image of the one we saw before. There's a peak in roll in the middle of sites that CFOS likes to bind to. There's a pretty high information content sequence motif that encodes that. So the instances have GGGC, GGGGG, um, almost exclusively, but not, not totally. Um, and it doesn't match the sequence motif. However, these tend to co-occur in peaks with a fairly conserved spacing of 30 base pairs. So. Uh, and we saw other examples with shorter spacing, like three or five or 15 base pairs for other transcription factors that have a shape and a sequence motif. So again, it would be interesting to understand what the mechanisms are for requiring this particular shape 30 base pairs away. Is there a big complex that's binding? Is it somehow creating a change in the recognition of the sequence motif, for example? And then we also um, 
expanded on the previous finding that transcription factors that have similar sequence motifs but don't literally bind the same positions in the genome that have their own binding sites are determined uh, by having different shape. So we re redemonstrated uh, what was already shown that, uh, for example, in this family that contains FOSL1 and ATF3, with very similar sequence motifs, there's actually a helical twist motif that FOSS is recognizing and a roll motif that ATF3 is recognizing. Um, and uh, this expands the previous finding, which had only looked at shape at the sequence motifs. We learned these shape motifs de novo and then found that they were distinguished, they were good at distinguishing the binding sites of these two factors from each other. So, um, to conclude, uh, most transcription factors are recognizing DNA shape, and we think this is a very important feature to consider in addition to the genome sequence, and I know the Hoffman Labs and, other, and others are also thinking about it. What our major contribution is, is to not only think about it as enhancing sequence motifs, but to think about it independently of sequence motifs, because we demonstrated that there were many cases where shape recognition is taking place without nucleotide sequence recognition. We developed an algorithm to learn shape motifs de novo, and basically uh, mocked what people have already done for sequence motifs. So created a parallel framework for shape motif discovery, <coughs> and applied it to over 100 transcription factors, and showed that um, these shape motifs can explain many strongly bound regions that don't have a nucleotide motif, and uh, found a number of interesting patterns when shape and sequence motifs co-occur, either overlapping or with conserved spacing, or where they uh, are complementary to each other. And we're very interested in digging into these in the context of things like transcription factor Deletion. So if you delete a cofactor, does it now become more of a shape recognizer or more of a sequence recognizer than it is when it co-binds with its transcription, with its cofactor? Uh, we're involved in a study with uh, Benoit Bruneau uh, with GATA4 and TBX5 and NKX2.5, which are important transcription factors for cardiac development, that just showed that uh, those transcription factors have longer sequence motifs when they're binding alone versus together, and we're now investigating that whether those are encoding some of these shape features. This provides a different way also of thinking about the transcription factors on a spectrum, and this has been pointed out by others before, but uh, we agree that it's very important to think about them as some of them being very nucleotide specific, really recognizing specific nucleotides and others more shape recognizers. And our preliminary results, not surprisingly, show that different families of transcription factors tend to all be kind of more shape or, or uh, sequence recognizers because they use similar structures to bind to DNA. The protein structures are similar to each other. And there's a lot to do. So um, we are excited that we have this first preliminary look at DNA shape without understanding sequence, but a lot of the tools that are uh, available um, for looking at uh, sequence motifs, like quantifying their information content, um, using them in discriminative learning, etc., aren't available for the shape motifs yet. So we have a lot of work to do to build up a similar framework and then to make more comparisons about the two approaches. Uh, we'd like to think more, as I mentioned, about the context and the uh, factors that are driving transcription factors to do shape versus sequence recognition, and very interested in cases where those change in different cell types or in the presence or absence of cofactors. I think we will learn a lot about the mechanisms through which proteins are recognizing DNA with these additional tools. So, I want to leave time for questions and to conclude by thanking the people who did the work. Hassan Sami, circled in red there, is the guy who spearheaded this shape recognition work. 
and the machine learning projects that I briefly touched on, uh, Enhancer Finder and Target Finder, with the work of Sean Whalen. Uh, so thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. So, uh, oh. Oh. let the chair. Ah. <laughs> it's his last. It's, his, it's, it's my last time. Yeah. <laughs> so my first question is, uh, and there'll be others after others. Um, do you have to define now this? You, you describe like four shapes, basically. Yeah. Is that the information space, or is there actually more shapes? There are more shapes. Um, so. Um, How do you find them? Yeah. So, so there are more. There are probably a lot more that aren't easy to find. There are a handful of others that can be learned from the sequence from these molecular dynamics simulations. So we can look at more of them, a few more with the existing results. But I think there are probably others that weren't described in those simulations that could be important. A key point is that those molecular dynamics simulations are on naked DNA. And so it would be interesting. You could really expand yeah. the feature space by thinking about chromatinized DNA or DNA bound by proteins. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and that's super important. And methylation. And DNA methylation, etc. Yeah. So I think there's a lot more to do. Um, yeah. Okay. Hair <laughs> <laughs> <Air director. laughs> um, so cool stuff. So the, uh, do you have any co-crystal structures of any of the examples that you gave where you can see how the DNA is binding to the transcription factor and you know, where that shape feature is binding relative to the, yeah. you know, the sequence recognition? Yeah, there aren't very many co-crystal structures of proteins with DNA. And so far, we haven't found any that overlap our interesting examples. But we're continuing to go further down in our list and see if there's anything that has been crystallized. Uh, there are efforts right now to sort of high throughput efforts to generate a lot more structures of proteins bound to nucleotides. So I think that data may be available soon, but there's actually not very much available right now. And I guess related to that, what's the range of variation, you know, with one shape feature relative to another? Like you showed the confidence intervals, but what does that translate into nanometers? Good question. Um, I think it depends on the feature. Um, the minor group width has a bigger range um, than like the helical twist, for example. Um, I don't know the exact numbers for like a confidence interval of this width is this many nanometers, but that's a really good point, and we could we could look at that by going back to the simulation data. Um, it there will be a relationship. I just don't know it exactly off the top of my head. Yeah. So um, regulatory elements have their own shape already that is meant to promote the nucleosome inclusion. So. I'm just wondering, you actually haven't shown that the transcription factors are recognizing the shape. You're showing that these fe features are enriched in the peaks, not that they discriminate the selective binding of the transcription factor, right? Um, well, they are enriched in the peaks compared to flanking regions, but it, tell me the data that, that the, you think I should use. The comparison to... you're making, because when you said it, you said you were just looking for the Gibbs sampling within um, the peak sequences. You hold that a certain amount <laughs> of peaks, right, to train and test on some. Mm -hmm. But really, that doesn't show you whether that selects for where the transcription factor is binding, right? You're not showing whether it's binding this position versus a distal position that's not ever made by that transcription factor. Are you saying we should call shape motifs genome-wide and show yeah. that those are rarely bound? Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. Like, like is it more discriminative usually... than sequence motifs, which occur in a lot of places where the transcription yeah, so you haven't shown that the shape is actually more discriminative than the sequence. Yeah, You're okay. showing that the shape explains right. some extra proportion that we couldn't explain with the sequence motif, but maybe that's just because it's a regulatory element and this is indirect binding, right? So it's open chromatin. Um, okay, so you said a couple of things. I, your first question I understand, which is um, uh, that um, 
a problem with sequence motifs is that they occur everywhere, and we'd love to be able to say which ones are actually bound or not. Um, and so, uh, and then you're saying we ought to show that also for the shape yeah. motifs. Do they occur everywhere? And if yeah. so, is there something about the bound ones that is sort of different? And then are we better at making that discrimination yeah. with the shape than with the sequence motifs? Yeah, because the past rose models with yeah. the shape augmented yeah. actually don't change the AURC or AUPRC yeah. or anything like that for determining the chip peak versus just random other sequences. Right. Um, we're working on that um, with like with a machine learning approach to try to see if they're helpful for discrimination. So we're working on it, but I don't have those results to share today. Um, your other comment was about uh, the fact that regulatory regions just tend to have certain GC contents mm -hmm. or other sequence features that give them distinct shapes. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think we've addressed that at least to some extent because of the central enrichment of the elements and because they are specific to a transcription factor. So a transcription factor recognizes it has it like a particular pattern of role. It's not like all transcription factors recognize that. And in fact, you may be familiar with work on uh, for sequence motif zingers sequence motifs that occur in the chip seek peaks of many transcription factors. Right. We actually found some shape zingers. So we ran a parallel analysis and looked for shapes that are in lots of regulatory elements. Right. And uh, a few transcription factors, shape motifs are zingers. They do occur under the peaks of lots of other transcription factors, but most of them are very specific to the peaks of that transcription factor and not to regulatory elements. In but general. you haven't shown like a pairwise distance, but we can talk about this after. Go ahead and say show, it one more time. Uh, I think I'm not like understanding. Distance, to show that that feature is only selective for that transcription factor, not any of the other 109 transcription factors. Yeah, yeah. OK, so right. We, I have that data. We have a big heat map, basically, of the occurrence in its own peaks and other peaks. Mm -hmm. And they are quite specific to the transcription Sorry, yeah, I finally understood what you were trying to say. Um, so when you uh, took the chip data and you did a cutoff of the top 2,000 peaks, yeah. so depending on the quality of the data and the particular yeah. TF antibody combination, sure. that might not be a very stringent cutoff. Yeah. That actually could be quite loose. Yep. So I'm just wondering if you take a smaller subset of the top best most robust peaks. Mm -hmm. Do you still get something similar or do you see more sequence motifs? Yeah, there? yeah. Great point. So 2000 is quite arbitrary. It was sort of based on computation that we wanted enough to learn from but not too many for computational reasons. And it doesn't mean the same for one transcription factor than for another. I completely agree. Um, we played around with the cutoff somewhat and tried less and more and that's sort of how we came to 2000. Um, and uh, you can learn the motif from fewer, like 500 peaks, um, but you find fewer of them and the, um, the enrichments aren't as good, the p-values aren't as good. So we, we kind of converged on 2,000 as a good number and maybe it's the wrong choice, but we decided to use the same cutoff for all of them just to put them on even footing in terms of the amount of data they were learning from. But it's a very important caveat that the quality of that data is different. And I think that's part of why we find lots more motifs for some of the transcription factors than others, or we find stronger ones, smaller confidence intervals around them. I think it might be that they recognize shape better than the other one, but it also might be that the chip seek data was better than it was for the other one. So yeah, that's a very important caveat. Yeah. I yeah. guess my, 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 what I was wondering is whether the really strongest binding events are maybe say sequence plus shape, and then the more That's moderate ones yeah, are a, like yeah. one or the other, and then yeah. the really weak ones are. That's uh, a great point. Yeah. Um, we looked at that to see if at the top of the list you tended to not need shape, and it was as you moved down to weaker binding sites that you got you needed shape, and we didn't find any pattern like that. But we had the same idea actually. But everything has shape. Yeah, I mean, eighty percent of them have shapes. So, um, but the um, if a if a transcription factor has a shape motif, it doesn't mean it occurs in all of its peaks. And so, it could be the case that 
it, only the strongest 50 use shape and the rest of them are recognizing sequence. That doesn't seem to be the case. I, I think it's more to do with the context in which they're binding, whether there's cofactors or not, um, et cetera. Um, but it may also relate to how good the sequence matches to the, se how good the sequence matches the sequence motif. So in cases where they do overlap, you could imagine that a weak sequence motif that really matched the shape might be okay. Whereas if you had no shape, you need a stronger match to sequence. We're kind of playing around with that. We haven't found any strong evidence of that yet, but it seems in my head logical that that might be the case. Yeah. Um, for the Cases where you have a conserved um, shape motif but not a conserved sequence motif, have you looked for um, clusters of conserved sequences within the, the pooling sequences? So let me say it back and make sure I understand. Uh, when there's a, a shape motif and you look, look at the instances of it and there is and you make the logo, there's not a, there's low information content in the sequence, but there might be sort of you're su suggesting there might be like. Three very four. different sequences that all encode that shape. Just yeah, anecdotally, that's exactly what we've seen, um, but uh, we haven't formalized that into uh, like clusters yet. So um, we've seen some examples of that. So you could imagine that there'd be no sequence motif because there were very, very distinct things that could all drive that same one. If you had a lot of peaks and you searched, as we did, for f up to five motifs, sequence motifs for each factor, you would think you might learn those three examples. So I don't think it's prevalent. But we have seen anecdotally a couple of cases of that. You yeah. mentioned there was one uh, shape motif that um, was only, could only come about with a certain sequence? Um, they vary. Or so or some or of them or really, um, uh, can't come about with as many different sequences. They have sort of a sequence information content that, so some of them, lots of sequences can encode that same shape. Um, and that's what I meant by we need sort of some metrics to quantify their information content, both in terms of the shape, how much information is in the shape, but also sort of how many different kinds of sequences can give you that shape. So we're kind of working on both of those. So for the for the transcription factors, you don't have the sequence motif. Could that be because they are interacting with some other transcription factors? Yeah, I mean, a, a, an obvious hypothesis is that they have a cofactor and they don't contact DNA. Sorry. If they always had the same cofactor, then the DNA sequence that the cofactor recognizes should be enriched underneath their peaks. So when we do de novo motif finding, you should find the cofactor sequence motif. So the fact that 56% of peaks don't have any sequence motif. Not only do they not have the known motif for that factor, but they have no enriched sequence motif, suggests that either that's not happening or that that transcription factor needs a cofactor, but it can be a bunch of different cofactors. It doesn't matter which one. So something like EP300 that's found in a lot of enhancers and doesn't have a strong sequence, particularly strong sequence motif, is probably physically interacting with a lot of DNA, different DNA-specific transcription factors. But, um, and that would then mean there still wouldn't be a sequence motif, but it is doing what you said. It's not directly contacting DNA. It has a protein interaction with something that does contact. But if it was a very specific, like data 4 and TBX5 that I mentioned, often co-bind, um, if, if a factor that doesn't touch DNA has a Required or frequent cofactor, you would find the cofactors. Any other questions? So, thank you very much, Katie. It's been yeah, a great thank you. Talk.